Hello world, I managed to miss a video with Hamza and Dan Barker. I was told about it and after a good dose of Valium and turning down the speakers to accommodate for the high-pitched, loud and hectic voice, I started watching it. <laughs> after just a few minutes, I started groaning in despair and frustration. After the usual introduction, Hamza can now spend 20 minutes doing what he loves spewing nonsensical drivel which nobody can immediately check and nobody can interrupt his onslaught on the brain cells of normally equipped humans. Less critical and naive co-inhabitants of planet Earth will naturally applaud feverishly. Now, as per usual, Hamza asks some inane questions, such as his all-time favorite tautology, why does something exist rather than nothing? Why does something exist rather than nothing? obviously thinking that something has a higher intrinsic value than nothing. When Hamza, well, would he know just a teeny weeny bit about philosophy, which he seems to think is a word which elevates his trivial dribble to the hitherto unknown scholastic heights, would know is that there is a well-known encyclopedia, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, where one, should one be so inclined, could find a rational answer and many a perspicuous argument regarding his eternal question, why is there something rather than nothing? Their answer is, well, why not? Who would have known that life can be so simple? The paper actually makes fun of the question and proceeds to demonstrate that this is actually quite a stupid and primitive question, but what would we expect from William Le um, from Hamza Tzotzis? It boils down to a similar approach I took when demonstrating the ridiculous Kalam cosmological argument, or KCA. You have to look at the definitions. But if you enjoy more of this light-hearted essay on, on heavy topics, I recommend this one. Now, while I was listening to the falsetto voice reaching its first crescendo, I suddenly noticed the appearance of a new I-era paper on embryology and the Quran. Well, actually an oxymoron, by the way. Since its initial appearance, it has now evolved into version 2.0. Is it any better than the previous versions? This was the opinion of, well, a real-world biologist on the predecessor. And summarizing, it's total bullshit and actually shows the puerile shallowness of the Quran to good effect. It's quite possibly the most overwrought, absurdly contrived, pretentious expansion of feeble post hoc rationalizations I've ever read. As an exercise in agonizing data fitting, it's a masterpiece. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. So, let me shelve the video for a moment and spend a bit of grey matter analysing the latest release of a pamphlet or a leaflet which seems to require irrefixes every few weeks. But I'm sorry, there's 77 pages, so this is going to be a little bit longer. The title, Embryology in the Quran, is already a misnomer, as th the words scientific linguistic somehow make no sense in this combination. Also, chapter 23 of the Quran consists of 118 sentences or verses or ayat. Hamza looks at only three and not the entire chapter. And if you Darwin, what did Darwin say in class? He said, if you were to evolve like the sharks, then it'd be okay to bring it with He now summarizes this from the clay, from the say, and da 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 da. And this is what Hamza Tzotzis considers to be scientifically accurate and unknown in the 7th century. It is the summary of the most detailed sentences on human creation in the Quran and what he considers to be embryology. While a previous version of his pamphlet still contained the claim of a Quran demonstrating knowledge not available in the 7th century, the following one did, and the current one initially makes the mild assertion that the Quran does not negate established facts or reality. How exactly established facts are established, or what the definition of an established fact is, we are not told. The actual text, in form of an abstract, starts on page 5 of these 77 pages. Well, while the number of pages actually sounds impressive, the content is not. It consists of repetitions and text in unusually big font. If I were to write this, I would use less than a page. But, but let's take a look at this before passing judgment, so ignore my previous comment.
and maybe I can make some shortcuts so that this will not be an hour long refutation video. So Hamza is not too sure what to call this stuff, so he fluctuates between paper, analysis, and study. And he says the study will provide a linguistic breakdown of the relevant verses and correlate these linguistic items to establish facts in the field of embryology. A study normally follows the evidence, and normally in form of a question such as can the sentences be correlated with scientific texts? But instead, Hamza says he will correlate sentences from a religious book with established science, insinuating that one can do so. This means he will take a result and look for a way to correlate it, not the other way around. But now, can anyone explain to me what established facts actually are? Established by whom or what? For what? And why? I get the strong impression that over time his IQ development is inversely proportional to his BMI. He throws around words such as linguistic items without bothering to explain them. He will correlate them with the relevant verses where I wonder what they are supposed to be relevant to. So we the reader get the announcement that we will now receive an overview of exegesis of the Quran. The last time I checked, the word exegesis meant a critical explanation or interpretation of a religious text. But what we will get in contrast is an apologetic explanation. I am also at a loss what an overview of exegesis is supposed to be. What has me baffled is how the Quran should be made accessible or intelligible when the Quran itself states in numerous sentences that it is easy to understand, clear, explained and easy to remember. What I will strongly contest here is the choice of words in the next sentence before moving on, as almost every sentence is faulty, wrong, a lie or fabricated. This is address various contentions which attempt to challenge the credibility of the Quranic discourse. No, no, no. It is Muslims who make a claim. The claim is that the Quran is scientifically accurate or does not contradict reality or whatever you want to call it. Nobody challenges the credibility of the Quran, whether in discourse or not. That is down to faith. People like me challenge claims other people make. Claims made by humans. The Quran exists. How can anyone challenge that? The claim, well, that, that it is scientifically accurate is what is challenged. When shown they can't meet the challenge, apologists like Hamza modify their claims and tone it down to say it does not go against scientific accuracy. When this is proven wrong, well, then they say the Quran is accurate. And when this is proven wrong, the claim is now the Quran does not negate reality. And Muslims need to prove their claims. I don't claim anything but see that the claims made by Hamza are wrong, faulty, erroneous and fabricated. I don't accept them. I show why they are childish and naive and wrong. Because people have shown him well, the previous errors, we are now on version 2 of this paper. Will Muslims start doubting this nonsense when this study paper is on version what, 58? How come Muslims never wonder why, if all of this is so clearly resembled in reality and was miraculously known in the 7th century, this is never mentioned in any contemporary biology journals. The only time the Quran does get mentioned is to show what people believed in ancient times and what was wrong with it. And at the end of this page, um, we are given a summary of the three sentences in the Quran. And before I get a fit reading the rest of page five, let's move on to page six. It starts off by asking, what is the Quran? What? Hang on, the title of the paper is Embryology in the Quran. Wouldn't it be logical to first ask what is embryology and then compare what the Quran has to say in comparison to reality? Okay, let's follow the approach of I have a result, so how can I prove it? And we will see a bit later why he has every reason not to define embryology. So Hamza decides to kick off with lecturing us on the book itself. Why does the Quran mean reading? Hamza admitted that he does not really speak any Arabic, so he has to rely on experts who do know the language. But then why does he change the opinion of experts from recitation to reading? 
We also get a free lesson in Arabic for what it's worth, being told that Al-Kitab lexically implies a written book. Now, how can, how can a lexicon imply something? It's the opposite. Does anyone know of a non-written book? <laughs> oh dear. And how does the word book automatically lead to writing, reading, and reflecting upon? And now we get the mind-blowing, stupefying information that the Quran is divided into chapters. Wow. Well, next we see something Hamza loves doing, the appeal to authority. He is too limited in his intellectual capability to make a point and uses quotes attributed to someone else. The normal usage is to make a point, explain the reasoning, why this is valid, and then back up with scholars who hold similar opinions or interpretations. Hamza does not even bother making a point, but instead quotes someone else. Is the opinion of someone else saying something nice about the Quran relevant here? Uh, hardly. And I mean, letting us know that the Quran is read a lot is hardly useful for anything. The next paragraph shows the full extent of Hamza's dilemma. On the one hand, the claim that the Quran was written in heaven by a god on tablets, golden tablets, and then read out by this god to an angel made from light. And this angel manages to miraculously teleport to earth, recite the same contents to Muhammad crouching in a cave on his own without any witnesses, who then passes it on to his fellow Arabs, who then tell this to scribes who write the text down. And it says here that Muhammad did not author the Quran, yet later he asks how Muhammad could have known what was right or wrong and selected what belonged into the Quran. That's a bit weird. But then Hamza he demonstrates what happened historically and the inherent problems with this, because as Zakani, a Quran scholar, makes a comment in the ninth century of the Common Era. The earliest texts we have today date from around the 9th century. We don't have a date when the Quran was first completed. We have some pages with Quranic sentences on them, which range anything from the 6th to the 8th century. And this is not totally unexpected, as it is similar to the duration of writing the New Testament. Similar also is the lack of contemporary documents regarding Muhammad himself. We have only the hearsay collection of the hadiths and the biographies and they were written hundreds of years after Muhammad is said to have died. We simply don't have any contemporary texts or accounts. Comments turn up well after Islam was established and when criticism was not actively encouraged. Now, this quote also illustrates the fact that the Muslim God is a highly anthropomorphic God. Muslims have an astonishing knowledge about the characteristics of their God, such as being able to see, talk, and only use the Arabic language. And next up, we get told that we will be treated to a scientific exegesis. But hang on, how can that work? I mean, scientific means it is accurate, has been tested, measured, observed, treated to experiments, can be falsified, and is able to predict. Exegesis is a critical interpretation of text. A religious text. All it does is explain what the text meant for the audience in the setting of the 7th century and then explain what the text could mean in our contemporary environment. Now if I have a battery I can I can ponder and reflect for ages about its ability to start my car. It will not help me in any way. Neither will the Quran. I have to measure it using a scientific instrument. If I then measure the voltage of a battery, can I interpret this reading in any way I want? Can I measure the voltage of a battery as, let's say, being 7 volts and ignore it as a possible fault when my car will not start? No. Can I read a book such as a James Bond novel and scrutinize the various gadgets he receives from Q for scientific accuracy? Come on, pull the other one. But Hamza expects us to believe that the Quran is scientifically accurate and yet requires scientific exegesis. When the Quran itself says it does not need this as it is easy to understand and remember, clean, clear, fully explained for all humans in all times. 
But Hamza now claims that the method of the delivery of the words of the Quran will explain the meanings and the rulings. But does this mean I can finally calculate inheritance correctly after I have been explained what a number such as two thirds means? Mm. Moving on to page seven. And now the reader is told what is required for the scientific Quran exegesis. Well, you take a Quran and prepare to be confronted with some puzzles where you need to mix and match the sentences, such as the author of the Quran did not want to divulge the information where exactly sperm are produced. So instead of correcting the prevailing opinion, the location is given in form of a puzzle between the backbone and the ribs. Because we know the exact location today and the area mentioned does not include the testicles, even when being very generous, the interpretation of these words has undergone some miraculous evolution. But more on that a bit later. Next we need information on some really important stuff, such as the length of a beard or whether to drink water with your left or right hand, and whether the well the poison is on the left wing of a fly and the antidote on the other or was it vice versa? Important things to ponder over and reflect their meaning, all collected in several books telling us what Muhammad did or said. The Sunnah. In the form of hearsay of what a person in the ninth century heard from his son who knew a man who had a cousin who heard from a nephew whose brother married the sister of the wife of someone whose daughter was friends with the daughter of one of Muhammad's numerous wives that Muhammad commanded not to speak on the toilet. Because Salman reported that it was said to him, your apostle teaches you about everything, even about excrement. <laughs> this is known as an unbroken chain of narration and is considered to be accurate because, uh, well, it just is. To top it off, we get some special pleading and some emotional pleading and the most stupid argument the language is a source for the exegesis of a book. If I, I mean, if, if it would have said translations, I would have understood and accepted it. But the language as such, maybe I'm wrong here, but would someone, I mean, I, I would need someone to demonstrate how this is possible and the consequences thereof. On to paper eight. Now here Hamza does the usual quoting without conclusion trick to show us how science requires the Quran to understand it and that the Quran is the foundation for all types of knowledge without any explanation or evidence. I mean, it's asserted by an 11th century theologian and we need to blindly accept that there are approximately 750 verses or sentences in the Quran conveying scientific contents, such as planets orbiting the sun, but which is not mentioned in the Quran. What is mentioned is, I mean, the fact that Earth has day and night. Does, does this make it scientific? Does the Quran state that Earth is a sphere and orbits the sun, that seasons are caused through a tilted north-south axis, which in turn causes commands regarding fasting from sunrise to sunset to be invalid? No. What follows is an attempt at a definition of science itself by a contemporary si No. Hamza quotes a long dead philosopher to define science today. What escapes me is why there should be no consensus on what science is. Maybe theists can't agree, or maybe philosophers of past centuries could not agree, but I don't think I am wrong in saying that scientists today generally agree on the definition. On page 9, we are now shown some examples of what caliber the Quranic science sentences are. Oh dear. Who created all things and made them to an exact measure? How can this be observed, measured, tested, falsified and applied? This is outright creation to be accepted on faith, blind faith. Is there anything remotely scientific about this sentence? Is it accurate, precise? No, none of the above. And the rest is just as mindless and totally inconsequential. And let me give you a sample. The Quran is an intrusive, intrusive text that seeks to engage with the inner dimensions of man. Can anyone explain what this means? Does this in any way explain the language used or the words used to convey a meaning regarding embryology? I mean, searching a bit, I came across an explanation. 
the texts also extensively explore the relation between heart, mind and human nature, between the inner self and the outer world, and whether human, or the nature is good or evil, a cumulative emphasis on the inner dimensions of man that most scholars formerly believed came much later in Chinese intellectual history. It's a Taoist explanation, and not what a Muslim would have thought at the beginning of the sentence. Or the result is that scriptures, being devoid of their multidimensional essence, have lost their power to invoke the inner dimensions of man's spiritual nature. Does that sound any better? It's a Jewish text. Now, let me leave the excursion into the world of spiritual mumbo jumbo. On page 10, we get Hamza's pet hobby, make science and the contents of scientific findings look bad, make science into a tism. Utter rubbish. Science is not a view, it is a tool. Can a hammer, also a tool, prove itself or question itself? Does it need to? Hamza pretends that there is a claim, but he just made that up himself and then says it is wrong and declares himself the winner. <laughs> what an idiotic and primitive human being. Now this mix between outright lying and just the inane claims continues throughout the page. A definite highlight is his statement, since evolutionary changes are inventable. Oh goodness, I have no words available to me able to express the sadness, pity and simultaneous contempt I feel for a person getting real money for writing this and then distributing it all over the internet for anyone and everyone to see, without any shame or remorse. Now a person can be ignorant, okay, I am ignorant of many things, but I, I, I try not to flaunt or write down my ignorance and then send it to everyone on this planet. I mean a person has the choice to stay ignorant on a given topic, or that person can stay willfully ignorant. Nevertheless, talk about it as though there was some knowledge and finally even lie to others, deceiving them on purpose. And this demonstrates again that the morality of an atheist is by far superior to that of any theist, because an atheist does not require any threat or reward for any altruistic action. In spite of what the Quran allows, I don't keep slaves for wives or I don't kill anyone for what they say or believe. Hamza on the other hand condones the cutting off of limbs as punishment, which I consider barbaric. A theist only acts on commands and can lie as they please when it comes to their favorite fairy tale book. But let's get back to the pamphlet. On page 11, Hamza contradicts what he said on page 8 by quoting Muhammad Moha Ali in his book The Quran and the Orientalists, claiming that the Quran contains scientific facts and truths that have only recently been discovered by man. He does so without providing any proof or evidence, just the assertion. He uses this quote in other pamphlets and topics and the view held by Professor Ali and it, I mean, is remarkably similar to Hamza's blinker view. I found the book online and saw only the usual twisting and reinterpretation employed by Yahya Naik et al. Nothing new, just good old post hoc rationalization or retrofitting. What is strange is that nobody ever mentions the absurdities in the Quran, like the split moon, ants and birds that can communicate with a human, mountains acting as stabilizers, a parted ocean, a flying mule, birds killing an army of elephants by dropping stones on them, a stick turning into a snake, and my favorite, the stake temporarily reviving the corpse. Are all these scientifically accurate and demonstrable? Does Hamza feel sheepish about all this nonsense? No, on the contrary, Hamza now claims that the Quran rejects the mistakes of the 7th century knowledge level. He does not say where and how. He seems to follow Muhali in the mountains are pigs and that the Quran never mentions invisible pillars, a firmament without cracks, and sun and moon orbiting earth. But now finally on page 12 we come to the embryology section. We find a repeat of the three Quran sentences we've already seen and that fills another page. 
Hamza in his ignorance now proceeds to present Quranic sentences without having introduced what embryology actually is. So he's comparing the Quran to something unknown. He does not specify that the scientific branch of biology further branches into different sections all the way to reproduction and finally human reproduction and embryology. Embryology observes, measures, tests and then describes human reproduction, starting with the production of sperm. Now, let me play creator for a moment. If I were, I would have to explain that contrary to the production of the larger cell in the human body, the ovum, the egg, which functions inside the body at body temperature in a female, I could never quite get the production of sperm to work on the males. So I had to transfer the production outside the body where it's a tad cooler. But still some sperm were too slow or even immobile. So the placement mechanism utilizing erectile tissue also failed so many times that I made a deal with Pfizer to produce a pill by mistake that would alleviate the erectile dysfunctions. What was a problem is that once I got the sperm production going at a reasonable rate, I couldn't cram the transportation and energy liquid production unit in there as well. So I had to run some tubing past the valve which keeps on being stimulated and grows like crazy and kills so many males. I'll also have to fix that in a new version. The tubing was too short to have a separate exit so I just joined it with some existing stuff that worked. Also, because all this was initially supposed to happen inside the torso next to the kidneys, I, I forgot to update the book where I described this. So Muslims will have to specify that the sperm production is a few centimeters above the penis, but plus minus half a meter. And you see, then it fits again. What worked fine in the male somehow is a, well, is a disaster on the female side, as they all seem to catch some infection or other all the time. Also, my timing and function on the ovum production is a bit erratic, so the tuning leaves room for improvement. The ovum production plant has also received some complaints as it very often produces unwanted cysts, causing immense pain and discomfort. This is probably due to the fact that I had problems with the single production unit on the dinosaurs I had to retire and, and then the chicken, so I gave human females two of them, just to make sure that one of them worked well most, most of the time. I need to come back to this area as somehow the couples that don't want to do and the couples that do want to don't have offspring. I will never understand these humans I have created. Yet I won the competition and I'm called the best of creators. <laughs> now let's drop this role and return to Hamza's human paper. Hamza never explains why he picked these sentences, rather than some others which are on offer. Are these more correct than the others? Why not take the ones in chapter 22 or 40 which contradict the description in 23, but seem just as crazy or correct as any of the creation descriptions in the Quran? Hamza thinks and believes that humans, him included, are made from mud, or more grand, from clay, and even more extravagant, an extract of clay. He doesn't <laughs> at least get deterred by the fact that most ancient civilizations mention this and we know today that we humans are not clay but carbon based. Did the authors of the Quran know this? No. Did they correct the others on this? Also no. Well, he insists on the clay version. and Muslim apologists have over the years come up with the explanation that the significance lies not in the clay but the word extract. But seriously, does this change anything? No, not really. I, I could write extract of bamboo or extract of squirrel and I would achieve similar, if not better, matching results. In addition, there is no such thing as standardized clay. The composition between clay pits varies vastly between locations. And how does Hamza determine the components found in clay in humans? Through his scientism which works just fine when he needs it to. Hamza states that these elements are essential for human life. But which elements? No comment. Why does he so blatantly lie to others? Why does nobody notice this? Why are Muslims still applauding, clapping, cheering him on? I mean, he could have used any of the material suggested and utilized in the book. 
Okay, on to page 14, where we get the explanation for any doubts or inconsistencies, which is addressed by referring to Islamic theological understanding of miracles. The creation of Adam was not a natural event, rather it was supernatural, and it cannot be explained naturalistically. So if something does not quite fit, change the language to mean something else, or declare it a miracle, which can't be verified. In other words, the previous assertions regarding clay were just lies. Meaning, Hamza asserts that the Quran is full of science which does not contradict reality or scientific facts. If it does, he plays the miracle card and all is well. <laughs> oh boy, now, this is stupid. I can't believe a single being with, with two functioning brain cells can pay any attention to these idiotic claims. Any Superman or Batman comic reflects reality more and better than this. Now, how can anyone even consider this nonsensical superstitious fabrication? <laughs> then on page 15, the reader can now witness a real miracle. Because when it comes to a word in the Quran, the knowledge of the Muslim God is no longer required, but the knowledge of Muhammad, the illiterate camel driver, is sufficient to explain that in embryology, the nutfa is a single entity but consists of male nutfa and female nutfa. But if it consists of male and female parts, it's not a single entity any longer. And please make up your mind whether or not Muhammad knew something about human reproduction or not. Here on page 15, Hamza says, Prophet Muhammad explained the nutfa as a combination of substances. But on page 63, he says Muhammad had no clue about it, as he never spent time on human reproduction or dissecting humans. And that this, this, this nutfa seemingly reflects Galen's understanding of the two semens is sheer coincidence and needs to be neglected. That for centuries this was seen to be exclusively the male semen is sheer coincidence and needs to be neglected. Hamza does not even realize that his frantic efforts to project modern knowledge into an old text, this is futile as embryology does not even mention anything about a sperm and an ovum mingling or mixing, but they fuse or merge. Does the Quran mention this? No. And here I'm not nitpicking, but there really is a difference. Anyway, he soldiers on, trying to convince us that somehow the semen can be torn apart to mean a part of semen, which, due to his 21st century knowledge, could mean sperm. But it is simply not there. Nothing is there except the common superstitious creation myths believed to be true over a thousand years ago. If we go now and look what a biology student wishes to learn about embryology um, today in, in, in the modern age, we see that th this is the typical, let, let's call it um, curriculum at a university where you have all the overviews over the different modules and on the right hand side it shows you what you already need to know like cytology and then the various possibilities of cell multiplication. So what we see now is that we see not only the elements but we see that there are processes. So ovulation is a process. So what we get to see here is that you have some elements, which is the female and the male genital, genital tracts, and then what happens with them? And we see that the, the male genital tract, will, I mean, this is what you learn there, does not descend from the abdominal cavity, but only descends a couple of centimeters. And the same then you see with the ovaries, where you get the process, how the egg is being produced. Then we get the information that we will learn about the pre-implantation, which means that after fertilization, we, we learn about the processes that lead to the formation of the zygote. And then once the gametes, the sperm and the ovum have merged, not mingled, but they merge or they fuse, this forms then the zygote and then in the pre-implantation phase, this descends into the uterus in the form of a blastocyst. And then it does not go and cling to anything. It, go, it descends down into the uterus, and once in the uterus, um, it attaches to the uterine wall via an umbilical cord and the placenta. And then once the, the yolk has been used up, 
what we get then is all the nutrient and all the waste being transported via the umbilical cord. So we see that in, at a university we get the elements and then what these elements are doing, not just single individual words the way that the Quran presents them, but we get how everything works together and how it is being created um, inside the, the, the womb through nature. And then a very important point is you get here what can go wrong, the aberrations, because a lot can and does go wrong. And this is something that the, the, the Quran does not specify or notice or go into because, of course, if there were a God creating humans, there would be no faults or aberrations or whatever. But in reality, unfortunately, there are. So we have learned now we've seen what, what happens at university, how we learn everything. Does the Quran mention anything from this mini summary? No, nothing. We see what people learn at a university. We see that embryology contains words and processes. And this is the way that it works. You need the spermatozoon, you need the, um, the, the ovum, and you need the process of them merging. And all of all these elements and processes are crucial, yet the Quran misses all of them. The Quran does not go inside or follow in any way the actual events and totally contradicts reality. It represents creation by a supernatural being without any evidence or demonstrable proof. Remember I said I would explain why Hamza never defines anything? Well, here we see that if you would define what embryology actually says, anyone would immediately cotton on to the fact that the descriptions offered in the various sentences in the Quran in no way even resemble what happens in reality. The Quran mentions only a word here or there without any descriptions of the underlying processes. The human has to do that. In his desperation, Hamza declares the words as well, make it placeholders, where the human needs to insert the most correct version of reality. But a rational mind will immediately identify this as dishonest, trying to divert the attention away from the primitive and vague creation myth. Now, if we look at the description of how humans are created, we see that Adam is just somehow created and then fashioned. No details are given. And then the, the likeness of Jesus with Allah is as the likeness of Adam. He created him of dust. Then he said unto him, be, and he is. Well, I suppose it should be he was. But the main point is that we, we don't get told specifically who was created, how and from what. Jesus or Adam created how, using what process. He created him. Who exactly was him? With what dust? On earth, in heaven? Why can't this book ever be specific? And, and next, this is, oh, this is a good one. He created you, <laughs> he created for you from yourselves mates. Now, if the woman who is not named was made from Adam, she was Adam's clone with identical DNA. She is called Adam's wife without anyone telling us <coughs> about any marriage or even her name. But Muslims are called children of Adam. We don't learn whether this is literal or not, or how a clone who is not a clone can have sex with himself and produce offspring which results in the human race we have today. And then why are humans created? Well, we receive conflicting information here too. It could be to fill up hell, and, or it could be to worship one, one, one of the gods or the, the best of the creators or maybe both we, we will never know for sure the Quran cheekily asks who will revive these bones when they have rotted away implying that a god will take humans into some sort of afterlife with their bodies intact what the authors did not ask themselves in their ignorance is it true that all bones rot away what about fossils or mummies what about bones several billions of years old? On page 22, Hamza retracts his prior statements regarding the corrupt anatomist from Canada, Professor Keith Moore. Hamza revives him and even uses a decades-old YouTube video of Moore reading a script by Azul Danias, and he uses it as academic and intellectual source. Will Muslims realize this or will they politely applaud anyway? 
but now he needs to follow what Moore said, who incidentally did not speak a word of Arabic, yet managed to introduce the leech-like into the Arabic language. And this was soon found in dictionaries because it sounded nice and gave Muslims a seal of approval by a Western academic. Whether it was paid for is totally irrelevant. Because Hamza now tries with all might to get an embryo to look like a leech, which in the real world is, it, it does not, he needs to modify both the Quran and reality. So he resorts to using sketches and drawings and even manages to insert an image or, or photo, which if I recall correctly, he said elsewhere was scientism and based on Photoshop. Oh dear, now what? Would you believe me just because I showed you an image? Do watching Muslims realize this or do they apply selective amnesia so that in one video they frown upon images and in the next happily accept them as proof? <laughs> Hamza also faces the problem that an embryo has a huge yolk sac attached, which is essential for the development, but he can only make the embryo look like the desired shape without it. So he knows the result and now looks for the proof in the form of words which somehow make the embryo detached in some way from the yolk sac. But the embryo needs it regardless of what Hamza wants. <laughs> what I can say at this stage is that an embryo does not resemble a blood clot, a leech, a worm or a lump of flesh. Hamza, being the lying and deceitful individual that he is, inserts the word worm here because Professor Mayers mentions the word in an abortion rebuttal. What Hamza does not grasp, however, is that Professor Mayers was referring to the face of the embryo which was pictured in the anti-abortion poster complete with open eyes, nose, lips and ears. And the same goes for all his desperate attempts to find some sort of book using words he can quote mine, which mention any kind of temporal development between bones and the surrounding tissue, because he needs it to match the Quran. In the real world, there is no principle where a bone or the skeleton is formed and then clothed and dressed, covered, lined or cased. There are instances where bone is formed first and some where the opposite is true. The dogmatic description in the Quran is wrong, it is false, it is incorrect, mistaken, fabricated and dishonest. But you already heard this. I will now skip some pages because it, it would take too much time. I will probably lose some IQ points on every page because Amjaz follows the same pattern of deceiving others with invented similarities between the Quranic words and reality. And finally, on page 39, Hamza claims that the sentence we made him into other forms is used by all sorts of people and resembles reality. But it in no way at all complies with reality as the embryo once formed simply grows and does not change shape or form. Claiming anything else is a blatant lie. Even his quotes confirm this. The rest of the pamphlet, the, the second half, so to speak, starting on page 40 all the way to page 67, is Hamza waffling and mindlessly babbling about what differences there are between Greek medicine and the Quran. What a load of bollocks. I mean, even Muslim scholars such as Basim Musalam acknowledge this. Yet Hamza spends all this time scratching for sentences which can make his book look less man-made. He frantically tries to persuade the reader that at the time of Muhammad living in Medina, nobody had any knowledge of Greek medicine. Hamza goes so far as to implore us to believe that Muhammad was honest and would never lie. M maybe cut off a few heads and plunder commercial caravans, but lie? N never! Hamza only accepts the view that Muhammad was the only one with any knowledge on the contents of the Quran and that the revelation chronology can be reconstructed. He totally ignores reality and quotes book after book saying nobody knows for sure what the level of medical knowledge was. Yet even Muslim commentators and doctors notice the similarity. Ah oh dear. What is mildly interesting is that Hamza vacillates between Quran and Hadith. I mean, the claim divine and obviously human accounts. What is outright hilarious is that a pamphlet claiming realistic contents seriously advocates the presence of angels at some stage. Does Hamza picture himself talking in a kindergarten? Do grown-up Muslims take this guy seriously? I mean, really seriously? 
Hamza is clearly taking other Muslims for a ride, relying on their upbringing which discourages challenging what they perceive as authorities and scholars of the same faith. Any Muslim who uses their brain while listening to Hamza's lies, fabrication, focused deceit and clumsy misinterpretations will recognize them for what they are, willful deceit, trying at all costs to keep Muslims feeling comfortable and thus transferring money into his company's account. <laughs> if at this stage there is still someone listening, thank you for your time.